Hello, I'm Jensen Button, uh, Formula One world champion, <laughs> and you are listening to Formula One Beyond the Grid. Hello and welcome to F1 Beyond the Grid, presented by the new Bose noise cancelling headphones 700. I'm Tom Clarkson and joining me this week is a world champion. And not any world champion, this man lived through one of the sport's biggest fairy tales when, in 2009, he won the world title with Braun, who'd risen from the ashes of Honda's F1 team less than 12 months before. I'm talking, of course, about Jensen Button. I've known Jensen a long time. I saw all 306 of his Grand Prix, and I was even at his evaluation test at Barcelona in January 2000, when Williams organised a shootout between him and Bruno Junquiera for the seat alongside Ralf Schumacher that season. Jensen got the nod, of course, and the rest, as they say, is history. Jensen's career had its frustrations, particularly during the early years, but there was plenty of glorious success as well. And on his day, when the car was to his liking, I remain convinced that there's never been anyone faster than Jensen Button. We caught up over a cuppa on the eve of the Russian Grand Prix. Jensen had just flown in from the US, where he now lives. But despite a fair bit of jet lag, he was in a relaxed and candid mood. I hope you enjoy what he had to say. Jensen, welcome to the show. It is lovely to have you on. Now, you're looking very relaxed and happy. Um, how much are you enjoying life outside of the F1 driver bubble? Uh, first of all, I'm funny looking relaxed. I've just woken up. I'm so jet lagged. It's unreal. I've just traveled around the world, basically, to to come here to Sochi to to commendate and be a pundit. Um, but um, life is great. Thank you very much. There's a lot going on. And, and obviously, Formula One was, uh, you know, it was a massive part of my life, uh, racing in Formula One for 17 years. But Formula One was my life until... I was 37 years old, you know, from a kid, everything was aimed at Formula One. So suddenly walking away from the sport and, and finding other things to, to enjoy and other m types of motorsport to enjoy has been fantastic, you know, because it's, it's, it's all new. It's all new and exciting. There's new challenges out there, uh, in racing and, uh, and I've enjoyed that. Plus private life, there's been a lot going on. Um, a lot going on. I have a baby, which is absolutely madness. Even sitting here at this moment in time saying that I have a baby makes me smile because it still seems unrealistic. <laughs> I'm still a kid myself. Little Hendrix. Yeah, little Hendrix. So, um, yeah, we're very happy. He's, he's awesome. How old is he now? He is two months. God, you're right in the thick of it, aren't you? Yeah, so he still doesn't really do much. You know, I'm still waiting for him to talk, and I've heard it's a, it's a few more months. Uh, and, and he doesn't walk either. It's like, what are you supposed to do as a dad? <laughs> I mean, I know we're not going to play ball sports together because I'm rubbish at ball sports, but when can I start playing cars with him? Um, but uh, no, he's, he's fantastic. And the other, you know, the other day was the first smile um, that we got out of him and... Uh, it's uh, it's been definitely a whirlwind of emotions from from the birth to to now. Um, Were you there for the birth? Yes, I was. It was it was a planned birth because he was breached, so he was he was upside down, or he was the right way up, if you like. He he, he was driving a racing car from the word go, uh, in in the sort of racing driver position. So he was upside down, um, and they said it's 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 not safe enough to, to have a natural birth. Um, so we had to have a C-section. So at least I was there for it, which is fantastic. And I could hold Brittany's hand um, because it's a, even though it's a, a C-section, it's, it's a scary moment. You know, you're in a room and I've never been there for a natural birth, but with a C-section, they're cutting a massive hole in your, your loved one's stomach. And it's the weirdest thing because she's awake. It's the only operation they do, I think, that th you're awake for. Um, and uh, poor thing, you know, it's, um, Brittany can take a lot of pain, um, but not feeling something, I think, is the worst thing for her. She got quite anxious about it. And then he pops out and everything is forgotten and uh, a lot of emotions. So very, very, very special. You say he was in the driving position. He's a true button. Would you like, would, would you like to see him race? <laughs> go through it all again oh my god I, I, I probably it's it's like childbirth I guess you know it's it's 
amazing, but it's horrific for the mum. And there's something in, in a mum's brain that helps them forget how horrific it was <laughs> because they have other children. They have another baby and they think, oh, let's get pregnant again. And it's the same thing for a racing driver. I think you go through so much through your career. And a lot of it's great in the end, but you go through moments that aren't and it's, it's so stressful. And, but a lot of racing drivers have kids and that get into racing again. So there's a switch, it turns off and you forget all of that tough stuff. And you just remember the good times. So maybe, maybe Hendrix will race cars. Maybe he won't, he won't like cars. Hopefully he won't like cars because it's too expensive. But also just think of all of your experience that you can give to him and any mistakes that you made. I remember Jos Verstappen has said that actually he was put on this earth to create the best racing driver in the world in Max Verstappen and then he's used all his mistakes and learned from them and well I mean Max was always going to be good because Jos was a great driver and Sophie his mum was a fantastic driver because I used to when I was racing in karts in 95 she was my teammate so I saw her yeah I, I saw her drive I knew how good she was uh and then I it was a it was a bit of a secret back then that her and Jos were together but um and they had Max and he's possibly the the most naturally skilled racing driver that's ever graced this earth so um yeah there, there's a reason for it <laughs> it's like it was all planned out sort of 22 years ago oh, Jen, so did sophie ever beat you uh she was in the category above she oh, was okay. in the super eight at that time i was only 15 so she was a couple of years above me but um it was her and a, and a, a lady called lotta helberg the late lotta helberg um she died a few years back uh, but those two were just awesome they were so fast um, and it's the first sort of time I experienced women in racing, girls in racing. Uh, you know, we talk about it now. Where's the next female racing driver going to come from? And it, this was in the 90s. We had some great talent back then and uh, doing really well. And, and uh, Sophie, obviously a much younger Sophie then. She, maybe I shouldn't say this, but she used, to, she used to change her race suit just in the tent. In front of me, and I'm a 15 year old boy, and I'm like, trying to cover my eyes, but then not. And <laughs> yeah, it's a it fun times. Uh, happy memories. Yeah, and then I got to race against her husband. Two. The first time I got a point, which is in Brazil, was overtaking him at the hairpin, and then I raced against her son as well. So the whole family. It's madness, isn't it? Now you're back in the paddock with Sky. Um, how much are you enjoying being back? You're sort of the poacher turned gamekeeper, aren't you? Uh, it's initially i was quite apprehensive i i i was a pundit at silverstone last year um didn't really know what it was going to be like and thought it might be a bit of a weird atmosphere for me you know being a racing driver for so many years and then talking about racing but um i actually really enjoyed it and this year working with the guys um sky sports it's been a lot of fun. I've really enjoyed it. You know, I can actually go to races and be a lot more relaxed in the evenings. And uh, there's a lot of banter between everyone, uh, which which is great. Uh, and it's it's also really nice, you know, seeing people in the paddock that I haven't seen for quite a few years. Drivers, seeing the new drivers come through. Most of the drivers on the grid I, I did race against or, or while I was racing in F1, they were in the junior categories of F2 and F3. But it's it's nice to come back and, and see how they're all doing and, and and see where they are in their lives and careers, you know, seeing someone like Charles come through and, and sort of dominate qualifying the last few races is, uh, is something you just wouldn't have thought of three years ago. It's, it's all happened so fast. But gents, it's not a surprise for anyone who was around in 2005. Do you remember when BAR got slung out of the couple of races, didn't they, yep. for that extra fuel tank or whatever it was at Imola? And you at Monaco, I think it was, stepped into the comms box at ITV and, you know, ducked to water, wasn't it? I was so hungover. <laughs> <laughs> well, it worked. Well, it was, <laughs> yeah, they, they said, do you want to, do you want to commentate? And I was, I was like, yeah, that sounds like a great idea. And I completely forgot that I was commentating. I went on Saturday down to Cannes because Cannes Film Festival was the same weekend as the Grand Prix back then because now it's it's offset by a week i think uh it's a Cannes film festival i ended up um we, get, we we headed out onto a boat had a few drinks came back to a party uh i can't remember which party it was i think it was a clothing designer party i won't say which one but we're, we're loads of my mates and uh and they went home 
and I ended up staying with my trainer at the time and having a few more drinks and and they kind of lost me found me uh, and this was six sort of six seven a.m. in the morning and uh, they're like JB where are you I said oh, hang on looked around and I was on a boat I was like I'm I'm in can. They're like, you're kidding me. You're, you're, you're on air in a couple of hours. I was like, oh, okay. So I, I got picked up, dropped off in Monaco. I remember Richard took me to the hotel, staying in the Columbus, got me into the room, got me a Bloody Mary, <laughs> had a Bloody Mary, I had a shower. I had a sponsor event to go to, went to that, and then did commentary. And if, if you listen to the commentary from that race, my throat was, it was so sort of dry and, um, sounded pretty cool actually but um and I still knew what was going on even though I couldn't see what was going on I remember Rubens Barrichello came into the pit lane uh, for his pit stop and I was like he's just spe- he's just gone too fast he's, uh, he's I remember speeding. you saying that yeah <laughs> I remember you saying that how did he know that yeah I was myself, how can you I was say like, he's speeding and then they said he's just got a penalty for speeding in the pit lane so I was like see I know what I'm talking about, or, or, or hopefully they didn't just listen to me and that's how we got the penalty. All good stuff. Now, I wanted to talk to you uh, primarily about some of the key moments in your career, JB, because I kind of view it as I was there for all the races and I view it as a, as a career of two halves, wasn't it? It was 113 races to get the first win and then the floodgates open kind of thing. Is that a fair summary? Kind of, Yes. The funny thing is, the years before I actually won my first race, I had some fantastic races. I, you know, really, really enjoying the fight, you know, with, with the Ferraris, with the McLarens, with the Renaults. There was some, some great years at BAR in 2003, and then it turned out to be a Honda 2004. And 2004 was the first year I got a podium, first year I got a pole position in, uh, Imola of all places and just in front of Michael Schumacher in the Ferrari. So that year for me was one of the best years of, of my career. I always liked the challenger to, to the Ferraris. And Ross Braun actually said that, which, which really meant a lot to me. He said, Jensen is our competition, uh, which, which really felt great. So there were quite a few good years. You said the, the 2005 season we had three race ban, which wasn't great. Uh, and then 2006 was my first win. After my first win, we had four or five races still in that season. And I actually outscored both Fernando and Michael Schumacher, the two guys fighting for the championship. But the start of our year wasn't, wasn't so great. But a great way to end the year, it was like, fantastic. 2007, this is going to be a mega year. You know, we're going to be up there fighting with, uh, with the best of them. Came out with the Earth Dreams car. And it went as well as it looked. <laughs> <laughs> not very fast and we ended up sticking different winglets on it all over the car I remember Nick Fry walked in and looked at it and went no I don't like the look of those side pods let's, let's, let's reshape them so we reshaped the side pods um, to look better even though the wind tunnel hadn't said it was better we didn't have time to put it in the wind tunnel so we just reshaped the side pods we were in bad shape um, the same in 2008 so those were tough years but yes 2009 is really when the, the floodgates opened and and I was able to consistently be at the front fighting for race wins, Braun, and then the chance to race at McLaren. You know, you take that chance, especially back then. Now it's a little bit different, but back then McLaren was always going to give you a car that could fight for race victories. Can we just talk a little bit more about Jensen, the challenger? Um, and I want to take you back really to the very beginning and that shootout with Bruno Junquiera in I think January, February time, 2000, Barcelona. I remember it was an overcast, cold. You're only just turned 20. You know, what were your feelings? I was actually 19. You were still 19 at the yeah, time. Yeah, the, the first test was actually in Jerez. And they were supposed to decide who the race driver was at that point. But because we, we had BMW engines and they kept blowing up, so I blew up an engine at turn four, changed it, blew up an engine at turn six, and then the next one blew up on the stand. So we actually didn't do any testing. So we went from there to Barcelona. Weirdly enough, we got to Barcelona and no reliability issues at all. But um, yeah, that's, that was it. So we got to Barcelona and it was supposed to be a proper test, not a shootout, um, but it ended up being a shootout. How nervous were you? Well, Age 20, I think you were 20 19. at that no, point. No, no, I was still 19. You're still 19 yeah. at that I was, I was 20 when they announced me, and then I was the next test, which snowed. When I was the official driver, that's when I had my birthday. I mean, 
age 19 then, how aware were you of what was at stake? Well, I, I wasn't at all because I thought initially it was for the test role because Frank never said to me that it was for the seat alongside Ralph Schumacher. So I did the whole first test, the shootout, and I'm thinking this shootout's for the, for the third driver in the team, the test driver. And then it dawned on me when we got to Barcelona that it was actually for the race seat. But still, did I feel the pressure? No, I didn't. I was just a young kid that loved racing cars. I had no idea. Um, we also had to do a, an exam, true Williams fashion. We had to do a, a written exam. And it was an engineering exam, basically. And I, I didn't go to engineering school, so I, I was terrible. But so, I think Bruno Junchiera did, didn't he? Yeah, he was really good. So he good. would have been really good at that. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he annihilated me, and I remember sitting in my car. They gave me the... It was it was a it was a, it was a it was like five or six pages this questionnaire. I went and sat in my car outside. It was raining, and I was answering the questions, ticking boxes, and things like that. And I was terrible. It was <laughs> it was really bad, and I still got the drive. So I think Frank was just excited that this young kid was was quick. It was raw, and I really felt. I think he felt that he could build on that raw talent which which he definitely did help with i still don't think that they pushed me enough to work on the engineering side of things and i didn't know that i needed that because I, I felt that my raw talent was enough what do you mean they could have pushed you a bit more to understand the car a bit more you know I'd, i would come in and tell them what my problems were but i didn't know how to change the car to improve it to, to what i wanted so coming with understeer and i just say let's go understeer in the, in the fast corner or in the slow corner, uh, and I didn't know what could improve the car. You know, I should have been working with uh, the high-speed diff. I should have been working with the aerodynamics or uh, with the mechanical grip, and I just had no understanding of what to change with the car. How long do you think it took you? A couple of years. As much as that. Yeah, and that's why I had such a bad year at Benetton in 2001, because, you know, Giancarlo Fisichella, who was my teammate, and I'd been at Benetton for a few years. He was used to setting up a car. And he was the expert of driving a bad car because he, he would fine-tune it, even though it was still tough to drive. He could really get the best out of it, whereas I had no idea what I was doing. I jumped in it from a Williams, which handled really well. And then I was like, oh, okay. And tried to drive around issues when I should have been mechanically trying to improve the car. And you had some great races in 2000. There's one I wanted to ask you about was German Grand Prix. Um, qualified not brilliant I think 16th I'm but then sure. came yeah. through to 4th and everyone sort of remembers well Rubens his first win and it was raining at the end but I think of it as much for Jensen Button's 4th place because you didn't come in for wets and it paid off didn't it yeah I actually started last in the end because uh, I couldn't get first gear so Rubens didn't start last I did um yeah, I couldn't get first gear on the grid. It wouldn't take get the gear. So I started last in the race uh, and finished fourth. Yeah, I, I mean, I can't remember what happened. I just remember the last two laps chasing down David Coulthard. How mad's that for a podium <laughs> uh, in a McLaren? Um, and I, I got to him, but I was probably one second behind him at the finish line. But I must have taken wets because it was really wet at the end of the race. Well, you certainly didn't take it when a lot of other people came in. Okay. The fact that you stayed out like yeah. Rubens, okay. I think is what... Okay, and then we took later on another yeah, tyre change maybe. So. Yeah. so we did one less tyre change probably. Yes, I think that's what happened. Yeah. Anyway, great race. Yeah. So how tough was it then to go from, you know, everything was coming very easily at Williams, you were getting a lot of praise, you had... Fleet Street were all over you. Good and bad, actually. Yeah, yeah. Wasn't there? There was a bit of... Always. Always, yeah. <laughs> Always good and bad. <laughs> but then you go to Benetton and suddenly it's hard and people were questioning you and, you know, you're still only 2021. 20, yeah. How tough was that? Really tough. And I should have known at the launch of the car I had food poisoning and I was so ill. I should have known it was going to be a bad year. Uh, but... Uh, no, it was tough, and when your boss is very outspoken about you, it's, uh, it, it definitely hurts. You know, Flavio was a very outspoken individual, as we all know. And he was right in many ways, but you just expect your team boss to talk to you about it personally and rather than 
talking to the press about your issues. So that was is very this, Was this Jensen partying and stuff? Is that what you were sort of referring no, to? No, it or? wasn't the partying. I wouldn't say that uh, I was doing too much of. I think Only it the, was... I, see, I remember Flavio talking to the media yeah. about it. And just, uh, I remember in Monaco, I finished just outside the points. And he's like, look at him. He's, he's driving around looking for an apartment in Monaco. And... What he probably didn't even know is we didn't have power steering. It had failed. And my, the blisters on my hand were the size of my hand. Uh, it was one of the toughest races I've ever had and uh, just finished outside the point. So, yeah, uh, he was a very outspoken individual. But he, he was right that I didn't put enough effort in. The reasons for it were wrong. <laughs> I just didn't know what it took. And I thought, as I said, my raw talent was enough, which it definitely wasn't. It never is for anyone. And I think Lewis has proven that in, in years gone by as well. Probably one of the most naturally talented individuals. Still, you can lose races because you don't have the expertise in other areas. Um, so yeah, he was right. And I remember towards the end of the season, Mike Gascoigne as well uh, from the team said, you've got to pull your socks up else you're going to be out the door. And I spent the winter uh, in Kenya with Flavio and with Fernando and with Yano Truly in the training camp. And that's when it turned and Mike said, you know, this is what you've got to do. This is how many hours you've got to spend with me and with the engineers. And he was very regimented about it. You know, if you're one minute late for a meeting and testing, you're not going to drive the car. We'll put the test driver in. Um, but it really worked. It's sort of, I definitely upped my game and realized that, oh shit, you know, this is either, either you improve yourself and you, you, you do the hours of engineering or you're out, it's game over. The car was much better in 02, but how much of it is down? Oh, yeah. Well, the result, I mean, you almost got that first podium in Malaysia until the suspension uh, failed. Yeah, I was third and then the suspension failed yeah. with two, two laps to go and, and I was driving close. around. And then Michael passed me on the last lap. Yeah. So it was definitely a better car. And compared to Yano, yeah, I got more points than him that season. So it was a big step forward. And Flavio actually said to me, we, we, w we did want to keep you for 2003 but you didn't have a contract with us Yano did whether it was the truth or not I don't know um, and that's when we talked to Dave Richards about hopefully you know uh, sorting something out it, it be a R Honda so that was also, that was the second time that had happened because at Williams you'd had to make way for Juan Pablo yeah. Montoya because he had a contract you didn't yeah and the same things happen again it's it's a kind of did you just think the whole Formula <laughs> One world was very unfair? Williams was tricky because it was I had such a good year. That surprised me. The Benetton thing, no, because it just never really... And I don't know, I, I never really gelled with the team. Um, they were very tough on drivers and at that age it just didn't work for me. I wasn't strong enough mentally. Um, so it, it was tough. So I kind of got it and I kind of expected it. To be fair, even though my results were, were much better in 2002. So you chat to David Richards. What kind of a team did you walk into at BAR? Completely different kind of team to Benetton. Um, very open, uh, really well, w welcomed me with open arms. You know, I walked in, every person said hello as I walked in with a big smile. I was like, oh, wow. this, what, this Implication being that didn't happen. At Benetton, no. Uh, and I don't know if it was because it was a team that had won multiple world championships and I really don't know why the atmosphere was so different. They seem to be, I must say, quite a bit more serious as well. The BAR guys, the mechanics, you know, they were very focused. You wouldn't see them going out drinking in the evenings, fully focused on the job in hand. That wasn't the case at previous teams <laughs> in F1 for me. What about the relationship with... Jack Villeneuve, did you feel that it was very much his team? Yeah, definitely. You know, I think um, I felt like it was his team. He felt like it wasn't his team in 2003 because uh, it's when Dave Richards took over, basically, and I was his signing for the team. So I think for, for Jack, it was a, a strange atmosphere. Um, I was the new boy coming in, and, and Jacques was always the young kid, you know, the young, exciting signing so for him it was very difficult um i loved it you know it was exciting coming to this team where the team wanted me to be there but my teammate was a little bit apprehensive about having a young younger teammate coming in so 
how quick was JV? JV was quick and, and he had so much experience. You know, I'm, I'm racing alongside a world champion and he was such an exciting talent in the 90s. You know, everybody wanted Jack to drive for them. Uh, he was obviously at Williams and then he basically made this team. He had this team built around him. So, yeah, very, very quick. Uh, played the games, definitely. I remember the first race in, uh, in Melbourne. Um, where uh, he started in front of me and my pace was 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 pretty good in the race. And Jacques was supposed to pit on lap, I don't know, 22, let's say. And my pit lap was 23. So he came around, they said, in this lap, Jack, in this lap, and he didn't pit. So um, he didn't pit at all. So I was like, guys, what's what's going on? I'm supposed to pit the next lap. And they said, yes, and you have to pit. You don't have any more fuel to do another lap. So he'd been saving fuel so that he could pit on my lap and knew that I'd have to pit behind him. So he came in and pitted and I just stacked up behind him. What is said after a race like that? <laughs> well, the best bit was it, was, it was the perfect situation for me because that first race didn't really matter where I finished, but it really set the tone for being a team player. Good and cop, bad For cop. me, exactly. And I remember I, pit, I exited the pits 10 seconds behind him after the stop and I caught him at the end of the race. So I was 10 seconds quicker. So it set it up perfectly, really. It showed my pace in the race. Um, he was bad cop that race. So um, it really helped my position within the team and uh, the mechanics especially. You know, they're like, we don't like that sort of thing. We don't like mind games. We want straight, you know, this is one team. Um, so to be fair, it was a really good race for me. But at the time, it didn't feel that way. I was just really frustrated. First podium finally comes in Malaysia. Um, I mean, for a bloke who's, you know, won 15 races in a world championship, probably isn't, it's not a highlight, is it? But at the time it was. Yeah, massive highlight. You know, it's, uh, it was many years before I won my first race and I didn't expect that coming into Formula One. Malaysia is a, is a circuit I've always loved. Um, so to get my first podium there was, was pretty special. And uh, that's when you can say that the floodgates opened for podiums because I got my first podium in Malaysia and I, you know, every race it felt like I was, I had a chance to get a podium finish. Even if we made mistakes, we ended up on the podium. I mean, <laughs> it, it just doesn't happen these days. So it was, uh, it was a pretty special year and that first podium was, was great. It stood up there with Michael. I think it was Juan Pablo as well. He was quite good in Malaysia. I can't remember, but... Yeah, so it was Williams were quite good in Malaysia. Actually, it was a pretty they? cool podium to be yeah. on. Yeah, yeah, it was a, 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 a great race and it really made up for losing that podium the previous year in Malaysia. Yeah. What was your relationship with Michael like? Did he see you as the challenger in the way that Ross Braun did? I don't really know. And Michael, I'm sure for his close friends, people could understand him. But for an outsider, he was reasonably difficult to understand as an individual. You know, I had some great fights with Michael on the circuit. Um, I had some great evenings out with Michael as well. Uh, I remember... We need to know about them. <laughs> <laughs> I remember Bahrain, uh, my second podium, where the hotel, where everyone used to stay, it was the Ritz there. And then there were villas that you could rent around there, like five grand a night or something. And I think either Michael or DC had one. And we were partying in there after the race, smoking cigars, um, and singing karaoke. Um, and I got sent the picture actually a couple of weeks ago by Jules, my PA, and a uh, lovely picture to have um, of two, you know, absolute legends of the sport, especially for me back then. You know, the, this young kid with a multiple world champion and a guy that's missed out on a world championship by one point uh, was pretty special. Interesting you say the young kid. When did you feel you were no longer the young kid and you were part of the establishment and, and, you know, was it that first win in Hungary or was it before then? 2004, yeah, was the first year I felt like a number, I, I wasn't a number one because we didn't have number one and number two drivers in the team, but that's when I felt like the leader of the team. First time in my, in my F1 career. So it was my fifth year in F1 is the year that I felt like a leader. So it felt, like I had a lot more pressure, but pressure that I enjoyed because I had the experience to go with it.
We'll be back with Jensen shortly, but first this. Innovation plays a big part in F1 and in the ever-changing world around us. And Bose are no exception. Since we began this podcast in 2018, they've continued their relentless pursuit of innovation to bring you something brand new. The Bose Noise Cancelling Headphones 700. Smart headphones that let you keep your head up to the world with easy access to voice assistance because we're all too often stuck with our head in our phones, searching maps, checking messages and schedules. Well, Bose Noise Cancelling Headphones 700 allow you to do all of that hands-free as well as confidently take a phone call with the most powerful microphone system for voice pickup, even in busy and noisy environments. The new design is available in black or silver and incorporates intuitive touch controls, so you can easily change the volume of your latest playlist, phone calls, or the latest episode of Beyond the Grid. In fact, Bose's world-renowned and adaptable noise-cancelling technology could allow you to immerse yourself in multiple episodes of Beyond the Grid across 20 hours of battery life. And the coolest feature these headphones have is that they also include Bose AR, a first-of-its-kind audio augmented reality platform that makes astonishing new audio experiences possible. So make sure your head's up, hands-free, and your ears amazed with the brand new Bose Noise Cancelling Headphones 700. But for now... Here's to more amazing stories from that man, Jensen. So let's talk about Hungary then. We've made a couple of references to it. Um, grid penalty, because I think you had an engine problem. I mean, came through to win. Hugely emotional. Dad's there to welcome you. It was... Whew, even now. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was a weird weekend because I qualified third or fourth. I think it was fourth for the race but because in practice I had an engine failure um, I had a 10 place grid penalty because that's how they did it back then so I started 14th funnily enough the two championship contenders who was Fernando Alonso and Michael Schumacher they actually started around me I can't remember if they were just in front or just behind because they had penalties in practice for overtaking on a yellow flag or a red flag I can't remember which one so it was a real mixed up grid, which made for a, a great race because all three of us were fighting through the pack in those tricky wet conditions. Um, we were all on Michelin's, um, Michael was on Bridgestones. I remember the Bridgestones working initially for a few laps and then the Michelin's took over. And that's when Fernando and myself were, you know, um, making up big gains and, and passing Michael. But it was a, it was a, frantic race loads of different pit strategies and you had to make the right calls and what have you which we did uh, and I remember with 10 laps to go I had a 30 second lead or something <laughs> um, so it wasn't like I won by a few seconds uh, it was it was a you know went from not winning a race to winning one by 30 seconds emphatic yeah um, and you look back now if you had, you know is there a picture on the wall at home well, I'm in There's between homes. There's a picture with your, with your, your sort of wide eyes. Eye, wide, yeah, I know. Yeah. Eyes popping out of my head. So, um, yeah, no, I don't have any pictures on my wall yet. I'm just moving into a new house. So they will be going on the wall. Probably be in the garage, though. I don't want my house to be just full of motor racing. That's one thing I do not want. Um, but, um, yeah, that was a, a great moment. I've never seen so many grown men cry. You know, all the Honda guys, all the mechanics from from Honda, the the you know, the, the UK based Honda team, not just the engine team of Japanese, they're all together hugging, crying and so much emotion because over the years we'd had some great races, but we'd fought for this victory and it took us so many years to get. Did Honda up their commitment after that race? Did you sense any difference from them? No, I think already they'd, they'd, they'd committed because they, they had, they'd bought the team basically, um, which I can't remember how much it was, but it was a, fortune hundreds of millions to buy the team and they were also putting in that amount of money each year to run the car so i think it was the year where they spent was it two billion on asimo the robot one billion on the plane and i think it was one billion on buying the team and running the team quite so an expensive year then it was quite <laughs> an expensive year for honda yeah no wonder they had issues a couple of years later well, and pulled I mean, out <laughs> <laughs> let's talk about that because it came as a shock to everybody in Formula One, December 2008. How much of a shock was it to you when they pulled out? A massive shock. I had no idea. No inkling? Nothing. 
nothing. And, you know, even if you think that they're having struggles, or you, you'd never think they're just going to pull the plug completely. You know, it, it'd be over time, you know what I mean? But it was bang, done. We're pulling out, we have to, um, uh, as well as many other manufacturers were, was, were pulling out of motor racing. But it was a real big shock. I had been away training in Lanzarote, that, that lovely training camp that I used to do every year for, for one to two weeks in Lanzarote, uh, Club La Santa. Uh, and I just got back, felt fitter than ever, um, with Mikey at Gatwick Airport, of all airports, um, in the baggage carousel, uh, waiting for our, our luggage and bikes. And that's when I got a text from Richard saying, yeah, it's, uh, he is, you, you have to call me immediately. And he did. And I said, like, hey, hey, how's it going, buddy? He's like, got some, got some bad news. You know, the Honda are pulling out. I was like, what? That's it. Game over. And he said, yeah, that's it. The team is done. <laughs> did you have any idea what a beast the team was developing for 2009? So were you all quite hopeful up until that moment that 2009 was going to be a great year anyway? Yeah, I mean... Honda would, had still been, they'd been putting in a lot of money into the new car, a lot of money. Uh, and, you know, you'd walk, you're walking around the factory and spending time with everyone in the wind tunnel and they're like, this is, is going to be a great car. You know, we don't know how good because it's a complete regulation change. Um, we don't know what other people are going to build, but we think we've done pretty well with the regulations, you know. Initially, we thought we'd be two seconds slower with the new regulations, but we're basically as quick as we were at the end of the year now. Um, with next year's car, with the regulations that should be two seconds slower. Whether that means that we had a really bad car in 08 or a great car in 09, I, I, we didn't know at that point in time. Um, so no, there was a really good feel about 2009 season. Um, and I think that's why everyone pushed so hard to, to keep the team going. One, because there were a few hundred jobs that were on the line, but two, because we knew the car was, uh, was, was looking good. Were you tempted to get involved in the rescue package yourself? Well, we did. You did? Well, we found a couple of um, potential buyers for the team. So, um, yeah, we went out, Richard and myself, to, to find them, and we did. Um, we gave them to the team, and initially it was like, oh, that's, that's great. And then suddenly silence. It's like, hang on, what's going on? And then we were like, out of the loop, really. But uh, you weren't tempted to invest yourself? I didn't have the money to do that. No, no, I'm not saying... But I thought they bought it for a quid or something, or a pound. Or... Yeah, but I... Well, I'd love to have been involved because obviously they made a lot of money out of it in the future. But um, no, it went quiet. You know, we had buyers. We had people that were interested to put in the money to, to fund the team. But um, everything went quiet. And that's when Nick Fryer and Ross were trying to do the takeover themselves. We didn't realize that that was an option. You know, we thought we had to try and find someone to, to fund the team and to run the team. Go on then. So how good was it? You, you, as you say, there was a good vibe in the factory. The numbers were good in the wind tunnel. I think you did a first test on Silverstone National Circuit or something. Yeah. Did you know immediately that you had a, no. a weapon? No. The only thing I knew is that we didn't have any issues, which is great. You know, when you drive a car out for the first time, you normally have some issues, reliability issues, spent a lot of time in the garage. We had nothing, so it all went smoothly. Even though the power unit wasn't the power unit that was meant for that car and it didn't fit quite correctly. It had a spacer. So no, it was a good day, but everyone was looking at, at me like, is it any good? It's like, I don't know. I can't do Silverstone Stowe circuit. It wasn't even the national circuit. It was the fun, the, the, the school circuit. Really slow. Yeah. yeah. So then you take it to Barcelona then. And there's all sorts of wonderful stories that I've been told about, you know, you finding out that, you know, all right, lads, let's take, well, fuel levels and stuff. Just talk us through that Barca well, test. Because that was the sort of first yeah. time, right? Well, we arrived and it was, it was just a really nice atmosphere because everyone really welcomed us um, because we'd fought so hard to, get, to keep the team on the grid and everyone loved the, the colour scheme and you know, all the big teams were like, oh, it's so great that you, you guys made it happen. Lovely to have you here at the test. And we'd missed all the previous tests. We turned up for the last test in Barcelona. Um, and... Uh, Jumped in the car, went out, just so excited being in a F1 car, you know, to have a job. Um, did a couple of laps, a um, couple of lap times, came in. I came in and said, Shove, I'm not very happy with the balance. You know, I feel that we, we need to help the car at the, you know, with the rear end in high speed and front end low speed. And 
he looked at me and was just had a smile on his face. I was like, "What, why are you, what are you smiling at? He said, we're fastest. So what do you mean we're fastest? I said, probably people have just done install laps. They haven't done any lap times yet. And he said, no, 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 everyone has. And you're, you're something like four or five tenths quicker than everyone. I was like, wow, okay. And then we did some set at work, went back out, and I think we ended up just under a second quicker than, than anyone. How, um, hard, how hard were you pushing? Oh, of course. Every time you get in a car, you're pushing hard. Okay. Um, I also think that, you know, the gap that we had there was, wasn't that big. But because it was a new car, we just ran on low fuel because we didn't think we'd be quick. So we were driving around on low fuel and, and other people were running probably 30, 40 kilos. Um, so we're like, okay, right, we've got to put some fuel in. So we filled her off and went back out and we were still pretty competitive, but didn't have the second uh, in our pocket. Well, we did have our second in our pocket, but we weren't showing that we had a second in our pocket. Um, so yeah, I, I remember seeing a lot of the mechanics getting their phones out, <laughs> um, calling Paddy. <laughs> their friend Paddy. Yeah. yeah, their friend Paddy and possibly putting a bet on or, yeah. or two. Yeah. And then I suppose to go to Melbourne and to dominate in the way you did just reassured everybody that it was real, I suppose. Did yeah. it feel a bit of a fairy tale and you weren't quite sure up until that moment? Yeah, well, immediately we had always the car legal, the diffuser on the car, the double diffuser. We even had that over our heads at the first race. So it was a weird one. It was like, you know, what's going on? We've been through so much over the last few months. And now they're saying, is the car legal? And I was like, Ross, is it legal? He said, yes. The regulations say that it's legal. And he actually showed me the areas that had to pass the test and um, what have you. And I was like, okay, cool. Um, he said, just go out there, give it your all. And all we can do is... is is give, is give it our all. And, and if you win the race, you win the race. If it gets taken away from us, it gets taken away from us. But just go out there and, and, and win this race. I was like, okay, cool. When our practice was interesting, we had a few little niggly problems, as you do with a new car. Um, we also hadn't done any pit stop practice over the winter. <laughs> so we did a couple of pit stop practices and, and then we let the car we opened her up and uh, and the pace was very good. Qualifying came round and I think I was two or three tenths quicker than anyone in qualifying. Um, so it felt great, but it also felt weird having that sort of cloud over our heads, um, not knowing if we we're going to have it taken away from us. Then the race came and um, first lap was mega. I think I pulled two and a half seconds on everyone. Um, came away with a win. And at that point, everything was forgotten. You know, I, I didn't think that possibly it could be taken away from us. It didn't care at that moment in time. It was stood on top of that podium, um, looking at everyone cheering for us. Even the competitors, you know, they seemed so happy that we, we were not just there, but we were competitive and they knew our story. They knew what we'd been through that winter. So it was a very special moment. Also Rubens had a great race and was second. So we, we could share that moment together with Ross. Did you dare think about the championship at that point? No, definitely not. You know, we, uh, we just in, enjoyed that moment. Um, we didn't know if the car was going to work everywhere. Um, and the car was good, but in the race, we had a moment where we thought we're not going to win. You know, the, the uh, Williams, no, sorry, not the Williams, the um, BMW of the time, Kubica, and Seb in the Red Bull had chosen a better tire than us in the last stint. They were catching me. Um, so they were closing me down and they ended up crashing into each other. So we might not have won that race. So, um, you know, we've gone from everyone thinking the car was mega to, to possibly not winning the race. So... Uh, when they crashed into each other, I was pretty happy and I could back it off and, and look after the car a bit more. Then what is it like to be on a roll winning six of the opening seven races? What is it like to be on the crest of that yeah. wave? It's the weirdest thing because you just think, oh, it must be a mega feeling. Winning every race um, gives you so much confidence. For me, it was the opposite, really. it, it puts I put so much pressure on myself and not winning a race was... I mean, it, it sounded horrific. So I put so much pressure on myself because I'd won two or three races. I was like, I have to win this race. I have to win the next race. I was just a failure. Um, so it was a weird feeling and I didn't think I'd ever feel like that. But 
I felt that finishing second was a failure. Um, and I think having the third place in Shanghai was probably a good thing. Why? Because it was a tough race. We didn't get the win. Um, and then I felt like I, the pressure was released. Uh, and I came out a lot fresher at the next race uh, in Barcelona. Interesting to hear the sort of mindset when you're flying like yeah. that. So when it gets a little bit harder towards the end of the year and the world's closing in on you, how tough was that? Or is it a different kind of pressure? It was from Silverstone on, really. So the eighth race of the year um, was really tough because I had struggled. I mean, we struggled as a team, but I really struggled with tire temperature. It was always my issue in F1. And I finished sixth, I think it was, or fifth. I can't remember. You know, I hadn't been off the podium in seven races. I'd won six of them. And suddenly I'd finished fifth or sixth in my home Grand Prix, the one I really wanted to win at. <laughs> so it was, it was a real tough weekend and we just didn't get it. Just did not understand what had just happened. The car just didn't work. Which uh, after seven race, great races, you just don't expect to suddenly happen from one weekend to the next. And then it continued. The tough races continued. We might have finished fourth or fifth. All to do with tyre temperature. Uh, most of it. And also people were developing their cars and we weren't. <laughs> but why did you not suffer from tyre temperature early on and yet suddenly you did? Because we were racing in Asia and then Spain and Monaco. And then we raced in the UK and we raced in Germany, which was cold. Um, yeah, we'd just gone from circuits that were fast to circuits that weren't. And... Uh, different tyres, I guess, as well. But even at Silverstone, you'd have thought the loads through. You would, yeah. That's but, why I guess it was so confusing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and and also, yeah, you have to think that it was a year that was new regulations, so people are improving all the time. And if you're stood still, you're basically going backwards. So that was our big issue. We weren't developing anywhere near enough. Uh, once we realised that we were dropping back, it's too late because you start development. For example, if you want a development for race seven, you need to start it at race one. It takes months to get stuff through the wind tunnel and then actually get it made uh, to put it on the car. It's three months. So you've got to start the development early on and we, we hadn't. Uh, because we thought, you hadn't got the budget or because we, you thought you were light years ahead? And the perhaps... team had the budget. I just don't think they wanted to spend it. And then when we realized we needed to spend it, it was three months late. So... It was tough. We had one real update with the car that year. Yeah, that was it. On a, on a year that was new regulations. So we started with a great package. But uh, I saw a piece the other day where somebody, I can't remember who it was, but said that actually the best car that year was the Red Bull. Throughout the season, the best car was the Red Bull. And it was the car that really changed the way people looked at the aerodynamics for the future years. Because the Red Bull won for the next four years after that. Which I kind of get, but... Um, there were things with the with the brawn that were very special, and it wasn't just the diffuser. It was, it was the from the nose to the rear end. Would you know the detail was fantastic. Mm. And was it real squeaky bum time towards the end of the year? Did you think it wasn't going to happen at any point, or were you always quite confident? No, definitely. I, I think Singapore, which is, wasn't even at the end of the year, we had it qualified fifth or sixth, or even worse. And I was like, we're just throwing this championship away. Um, you know, I wasn't worried about Rubens so much. I was, but I knew he was in the same car. And even if he did a better job than me, he wasn't going to be that far in front. Um, but the Red Bulls are qualifying one too. And, you know, it's like, wow, okay, this is, this is turning into a nightmare. Um, this could be, we could have gone from having the, the dream year um, to having the biggest nightmare and the biggest failure in the motorsports ever seen <laughs> from winning so many races and then not winning the championship. So it was tough. And, uh, you know, qualifying was more difficult than the race. Um, normally we, we made up places in the race, but again, just couldn't get those tyres working in Singapore at night time over one lap. Is it because your driving style was so smooth? Yeah. That was... Yeah. Um, and I tried everything, but... I don't know what it is, but it just didn't work for me. I really don't. I still to this day don't know why I can't get tire temperature compared to others. Does it afflict you in, you know, you're racing in Super GT in Japan? Yeah. This year? Same problem? 
Yeah, it's definitely. across the board. It doesn't matter yeah. what the car is. Yeah, uh, my teammate's more aggressive than me, and he's he's better at getting the tyres turned on. And the problem with Super GT is if you don't get the tyres turned on quick enough, you get pickup on the tyres. So you pick up the marbles, and then it sticks to the tyre, and you're just sliding all over the place. So it hurts me there as well in a different way. So it's frustrating, but it's something that I've tried to deal with over the years. But I don't know what to do. I try driving harder, more aggressive, but maybe it's still not aggressive enough. I don't know. Were you like that in karting? Is it just... Yeah. It is just you. Same in karting, yeah. And it's something you've always done? or was, yeah. yeah. Did, did Dad teach you to drive that way? Or was it something that was just a natural thing that came to you? I always would drive smooth. And I think a lot of it was... Yeah, he used to put me out in slicks in the wet, so you couldn't be aggressive because <laughs> you're in you're off in, in the gravel trap or tie barriers. So I was always smooth from the beginning, and I think I learned so much as a young kid in karting when you didn't have much power. So you had to be really smooth, and the whole thing for me was driving as smooth as I could to keep the engine revs as high as possible, and that kept the minimum speed up through a corner. And uh, gave me a good lap time so it continued from there and I adapted my driving style as we all do but I obviously didn't adapt it as much as most <laughs> but you got there it happened in Brazil yeah. and you know we all remember that day yeah it's, it's a funny one because if I'd won it I mean I don't think I was ever going to win it many races before then anyway just the way the point system was but it's like it was the perfect season it's the perfect story you know, if they could there do it. needs to be a movie. Yeah, they, they, they need to make a, uh, they really do need to make a movie, not just because it was me, but because, <laughs> because it is a fantastic um, story, a Formula One story of coming from nowhere. I, as such, people think it, we came from nowhere as a privateer. It's not quite true because there's a lot of money thrown at this team the year before, but in a movie, you wouldn't see that bit. <laughs> you would just see this private team coming from nowhere. Oh, no, but the emotional roller coaster yeah, is there, yeah, isn't it? All exactly. The and, and the great races, the tough races, the possible disqualification, being crashed into at Spa, um, things like that. And then coming through in Brazil after qualifying near the back with one of my title rivals. You were really through. angry after that crash at Spa. Yeah. Grosjean. Yeah. I remember you were. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Big John. Big John crashed into me. Who would play Jensen Button in this movie? Mm. Me. I'm still young Why enough. Not? You just wear makeup. You're based over there anyway. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Hopefully he's not born yet. But normally normally it's uh, a few decades after it actually happens that they make the movie. Yeah. yeah. Actually, Elton John's still alive. That was a pretty awesome movie. It was, wasn't it? But yeah, winning in Brazil in the way that we did, uh, fighting through the field and... I think really made it the season that it was a very special year and a season that we remembered for many years to come I think and it was the end did, did you view it now as the end of a journey that you'd been on with dad yeah definitely I remember he was one of the first people I saw after the race and normally you're not allowed anyone in Park Ferme you know you might see uh, your physio Mikey Muscles who was one of my best buddies to be fair <laughs> Well, we've so so many years, um, and he was always there because he was there to take my helm off me, give me a drink. But they let the old boy in to Park Fermi, which you're not allowed to do. Or, or I don't know if they let him in, or if he just walked through the gates when he wasn't supposed to. But so I saw him. So yeah, it was a pretty special moment, and the cameras are on us, and it, and it made it even more special, I think. So uh, yeah, it was, it was lovely to be greeted by him when I got out of the car. Something about having Dad there because he saw. Every race? There was one race that he didn't come to. And there was a reason why he didn't. I think it was something to do with the team not wanting him there. Because they thought he was hurting my performances. It was probably Benetton days. Wait, right? <laughs> but James, do you, do you realise how lucky you were to be able to have him there? Because so many, so many people don't aren't able to take yeah. their dad and, and share those highs and yeah. lows. and. Well, in sport they're not, but also in Formula One, because a lot of dads are, are a pain in the ass, I have to say. <laughs> you know, they are a pain because they get too involved. Um, and especially back then, I think it's, it's a bit more controlled now by the teams. They're like, hang on, you know, you, you should know your place. You know, you, your son's a professional race driver. Um, but back then, they were really getting involved, dads. So he was great because he would always be in the background. Um, he, you know, he did... I had my 
schooling with him back in the 80s and early 90s. He knew, he, he knew at that point in my Formula 1 career he had nothing else to give. The only thing he could give, I guess, was a helping hand when times were tough. Why do you think it worked between the two of you where other father, racing driver, son relationships don't? I don't know. Um, I mean, he annoyed the hell out of me a lot of the time. <laughs> You're not being serious when you say that? Or? No, I am, you know, and, and he would say the same about me, you know. When you're that close to someone, there are niggly little things that annoy you. And, yeah, yeah there were times I was like, I'd, I'd say to Mikey or I'd say to Richard, I don't want my dad at the next race, you know, he's, he's a pain. Um, but then you had a great race and he was the first person you look for to celebrate with. So you're always going to have ups and downs. It's not going to be plain sailing the whole time it never is especially with someone that close to you but that's why it made the the, the emotions the good the good times so great and the the bad times even tougher i guess you know but he after a tough race he would never say anything to me he'd wait for me to say something and i could just you know i could see it in his eyes that he was hurting probably more than i was when i had a tough race because he wanted to say something more like tough luck son you know that was a tough one i know you'll bounce back but he, he, he didn't because he knew I'd snap at him. How alike were you two? Back then, I probably didn't think we were that alike. Um, but now I definitely think we're alike. And I, there's one thing that I have of his that I wish I didn't have, which is we get stressed about things way too easily. And it could be something to do with traffic on the road or, or what have you. And I'm exactly the same. And the thing is, I even know I'm getting stressed and I shouldn't be getting stressed, which stresses me out even more. So it's, it's little things and yeah, I mean, it can be stupid things, which is really weird to say. It's like leaving the house and forgetting my keys or, or doing up my shoelace and it coming undone or it's something as pathetic as that. And the or, old man would, get, would have got annoyed by that yeah, as well. Yeah, same sort of things or trying to put the dog leash on the dog or dog lead and it takes too long or he's fidgeting. I wouldn't get stressed to him. I get stressed to myself. I never get really stressed to other people or people that I love. It's, I get stressed to myself for getting stressed <laughs> about things. So yeah, it's, it's a weird one. Yeah. Oh, and that's definitely from John. him. And, dear uh, John, we all miss him. He was such a yeah, character, wasn't he? He definitely was a character. Was and, sport uh, misses him. Going way too soon, but yeah. you know, I've always thought that maybe you're just allowed a certain amount of fun in life and he hit his limit because uh, he definitely had a good life. So gents, why, why McLaren for 2010 and not Mercedes? Was there an option to stay at Braun slash Mercedes? Yeah, yeah they, they 100% wanted me to stay. Um, and I knew that Mercedes were buying the team. I remember sitting in Dubai with... Uh, Ross and Nick Fry and Richard, my manager, discussing it. And they're like, yeah, they're going to buy the team. They're not going to fund the team through the year. You know, the, the funding for the team and developments would all be done, would, would be through sponsors. I was like, hang on, really? I'm like, yeah, yeah, we're going to get sponsors. They're going to pay for the development of the car through the year. And Mercedes are going to own the team. I was like, well, that doesn't sound very promising and a little bit worrying in a way. And I also knew that through the 2009 season, we hadn't developed the car. And I knew that they hadn't really worked on the 2010 car. Um, and Ross also said that. So for me, it was a, an uncomfortable position to be in. You know, after winning the championship, to be racing for them in 2010, a new project that I didn't, I wasn't sure if it would have the, the right funding. Whereas you look at McLaren, a team that looked very strong at the end of 2009, um, should have won in Abu Dhabi, but Lewis had his brake issue, caliper issue, which is not to do with McLaren, it was the brake manufacturer. I mean, they, I knew they would give me opportunities to win every year I raced with them. So it was a no-brainer, really. Um, I remember speaking to them about a contract, and the, the frustrating thing for me was that Mercedes were going to buy Braun, but Mercedes also supplied... McLaren with engines so they knew Norbert Haug knew both of my contracts and he basically said he thought I was jumping ship because I would get paid more at Mercedes so he told Mercedes I think as far as I know what I was offered at Braun and he said match it and let's see if he moves 
and it was exactly the same contract but I still moved because I knew it was the team that could help me win races nobody could foresee what would happen with Mercedes five years down the road four years down the road and I actually think the reason why Mercedes has become so big is because they had such a tough year in 2010 and I think they were embarrassed as a manufacturer and thought we can't have this so we're, they threw we're either all in or all out so they thing. threw so much money at it and uh, this is so no the monster that we have now <laughs> <laughs> that everyone's trying to beat but no I you mean, can't have regrets because at that moment in time no one knew I mean when Lewis moved to Mercedes, I mean, you can say, oh, Lewis, what a great decision. What a clever guy. No, he, 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 didn't, know, he didn't know what they were going to achieve. No one did. He moved because he was frustrated because he'd had reliability issues at, at McLaren. Um, I don't know what he was offered to go to Mercedes. But nobody expected Mercedes to achieve what they've achieved. And fair play to them. They've done an amazing job. They really have. But back then... Nobody expected that. And is it quite fun seeing people like Andrew Shovelin and guys we've been talking about from your Honda days and your Braun days getting all that success now? Yeah, I was actually looking through pictures on the plane coming here um, from back back in the day, early days of BER and Honda. And there's some great pictures of my old man, Shove, and myself having dinner together. And, uh, you know, our first pole position in 2005, which is in Canada... 2006 which is in Melbourne and those special moments so yeah it's great seeing him achieving so much and he thoroughly deserves it he's such a great guy lovely human being and also very good at his, his job you know he was my chief engineer Bono who's now Lewis's chief engineer was my data engineer so I had a, a great team of people and to see them still achieving great things is, is fantastic now how nervous were you about going up against Lewis Hamilton. Um, I was I was not nervous about going up against Lewis. I was I was a little bit nervous when I walked into McLaren at the end of two thousand and nine because I knew it was I thought it was Lewis's team. You know, it was a team he won the world championship with. He came through the uh, junior ranks with McLaren and Mercedes, uh, and as one of my first questions, Paddy Lowe, when I first met him, sat in the conference room. It was all very secretive because I wasn't actually supposed to be there because I was still under contract with Braun. And um, I said to him, the first question was, so, is this Lewis's team? They said, what do you mean? I said, is he the number one driver? And they said, no. Of course, he's achieved great things. He's got a lot of respect from us, but you will get completely equal uh, equipment. I was like, fine. Where do I sign? And uh, sign my contract with them and look forward to the challenge of, of racing against Lewis. It wasn't, I was not fearful. For me, I wasn't fearful of any driver. You know, if I found out that they were better than me, they were better than me. I can't do anything about that. It was about the challenges and I won the championship in 09. I wanted the challenge of racing alongside Lewis and racing for a, a team that had so much history like McLaren. I mean, the reason I asked that question is that Alonso had effectively walked away. Kovalainen had, you know, yeah. struggled he, he he had form and so it was it was a he's world champion <laughs> yeah but I mean you know, it was gonna did you were you aware that this might be a defining moment yeah but there was no I mean if you're not gonna fight against the best of them what's the point there's no point trying to hide um, so that was a challenge for me and it was an exciting challenge you know I'd won the world championship I obviously wanted to win another one but to race against another British world champion I mean what a team British team, two British world champions. It was it was awesome. You know, it made headlines and the British media loved it. And that's not the reason why I did it, but it, it was also exciting to see that. And you were the first driver to beat Lewis overseas. <laughs> yeah, I was. Yeah, because Fernando equaled his points, yeah. I remember, yeah. in uh, 2008. So, yeah, I was, uh, I was the first. No, I mean, sorry, 2007. But, Jensen, in a, in, in a funny kind of way... Do you get more satisfaction knowing that you did that up against Lewis Hamilton, beat Lewis Hamilton over a season? Was it almost a greater driving achievement than what you achieved in 2009? I don't know. I mean, I don't know if I would compare them, but um, they were both great achievements. Um, you know, the races that you beat Lewis, I guess, or, or someone like Fernando, 
I guess they mean more because you're in the same equipment. Um, but more, more points over a season, I don't know. Unless you're winning a world championship, I don't really think that means so much. It's more the individual races that really mean a lot. Those race wins, you know, um, over the three years we raced together, I scored more points, but Lewis scored more wins. I think I, think I, I had eight wins and I think he had 10 wins or something. But um, I really enjoyed the fight. I enjoyed the challenge of, of racing alongside Lewis. And, you know, I wish he had the challenge at the moment. You know, at the moment it seems uh, it's all a little bit too easy <laughs> easy for him. Um, I know Valtteri has got the talent. It's just uh, the second part of the season has seemed a little bit more difficult for him. So when you look at it all, what was your happiest time in Formula One? My happiest time was probably the Honda days back in 06. Why? I don't know. I just love those years. They were really good. They were really fun. Um, I, I don't know. I think before I'd won the World Championship, there's just less pressure. Uh, and I, I loved the atmosphere and I loved the way Formula One was. I loved the sound of the engines, the way the cars looked, the way the cars felt. We had the tyre war as well. So I, I really enjoyed those years. Um, you know, Braun was, was pretty special. 2011 was pretty awesome when we had the blown diffuser because it was just an absolute monster. You know, they're all very different experiences, but 2011 was great because we had so much downforce. But it was something new to learn because the throttles were always open. 95% in qualifying was the minimum amount of throttle because we were pumping exhaust gases onto the diffuser. Um, so the downforce was unreal. You know, you, you basically had to turn the car at the apex and you, as soon as you could see the exit, you would f floor it as, as quick as you could because it just meant that you had so much downforce and something else to learn. But that feeling when it gripped up at the rear and low speed corner, it just gave you, gave you goosebumps. It was Rocket unreal ship. because it just mm. didn't seem physically possible <laughs> that, that you could have that much grip. So that was that was a really fun year. It wasn't the prettiest McLaren we ever drove. It was the the sort of U side pod car. I quite car. like those. It's sort of like a fighter plane, didn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe. It was like a JL. It's like they built them for Lewis and me. Yes. Um, but uh, that was a. Yeah. It was a good year, and you know, and right. for me, some of the the best races were races where we had, you know, Lewis and myself had a really good fight, uh, a really good fight. So. Cool. You know, we had to, best race, best race. Cool. We had Turkey where he he eventually won, but we had a good little battle. Um, we had Brazil, 2012, which is actually McLaren's last win in Formula One and my last win in Formula One. Um, we also had uh, Hungary, 2011, I think, it was my 200th Grand Prix, and we fought in the wet, dry conditions, and I I won that race. Um, those races where we were able to battle wheel to wheel and allowed to fight and allowed to race were awesome. You know, it's, it's unusual these days to see teammates actually overtaking each other. Normally it's done with strategy. Um, one might luck in on strategy the way Sebastian won in Singapore. You know, they pitted him thinking he's not going to be able to beat his teammate. We're going to pit him because of Arturi and because of Lewis and Max. He did an amazing couple of outlaps and he ended up in the lead. Whereas back then, we were wheel to wheel fighting. It was awesome. You know, it was the same for Weber and, and Vettel. I don't know if it was just so easier to overtake then or what, but there was a lot more fighting between teammates. And I think that, that racing really meant a lot to us as drivers. Your best win? The one that meant the most was probably Suzuka 2011. Just because I, I won the race by about second to Fernando in the Ferrari. And then Sebastian in the uh, in the Rebel, both multiple world champions behind me. Sebastian clinched the title that year, and it was the year of the tsunami. Um, the year of the you know that was a pretty dark year in Japan. So to to win that race it was a very emotional weekend, and obviously my other half was Japanese. So that one really meant a lot. The most dominant victory I had in F1 was probably Spa 2012. Spa 2012. That was the yeah. race that Lewis tweeted your telemetry. Yeah, well, he thought it was my telemetry, but it wasn't. I don't know. <laughs> it was actually simulated as telemetry of, of the difference between our downforce levels that we ran in the race and qualified. Um, interesting conversation after he did that or not? 
not really. We didn't really talk about it too much. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, it was one of those things, you know, that, that he chose the high downforce route. And of course, I chose the, the low downforce route, which of course is quicker in a straight line. It's what happens when you take downforce off. But in the corners, you go quicker with high downforce. So it normally balances each other out. But I, I really liked the, the, the way that, that wing worked. Uh, it was a wing that I had raced well with before, the rear wing. And it, it was the way that it laterally, when the car was loaded, the way that the car felt, I really liked. Uh, I felt that I got a lot of rear grip when it was laterally loaded and more than in a straight line. So it worked with my driving style. I had rear grip on entry. It gave me confidence. So that's the reason why I chose that wing, so it suited my style. And Lewis tried that wing in testing and didn't like it, so he ran the high downforce wing. And it worked for me, so I qualified on pole. It was an amazing lap. win. Yeah. <laughs> I'm interested that you haven't mentioned Canada 2011. It was spectacular, obviously, yeah. in terms of the way you won the race, yeah. but for whatever reason... I it, loved the... the oh, you did, okay, yeah. Looking back on it, it was an awesome win, but yeah. for, you know, I don't know how many laps the race was, but for every lap apart from the last lap, it was a horrific race for me. <laughs> you know, I had a drive-through penalty, I had a puncher, broken front wing, I crashed with my teammate, I crashed with <laughs> my future teammate, Fernando. You know, everything that could go wrong went wrong. Um, but we kept fighting, and I think that was one of those races that taught me that you never, you never give up in motor racing, however tough it is. The car was good, and um, that race I could get to high temperature. <laughs> <laughs> and it worked well for me. Now, look, just two more things. One is best teammate. Yeah, I don't know what best teammate means, really. I mean, fastest teammate would, would be Lewis. Um, and teammate that was strong in every area would be Fernando. They all had weaknesses, as I had weaknesses. But they were both drivers that would be remembered for their extreme talent and for their championships. Teammate that I felt technically was above the rest, head and shoulders above the rest, would be Rubens. Very talented when it came to setting up a car. Learned a lot from him. The one that surprised me the most was probably Checo. In his what speed. way? His speed and, and how on certain days he could be very quick, um, which, you know, certain circuits didn't work for him. Circuits that had uh, front limitation didn't work for him. Circuits that had rear limitation like Bahrain worked very well for him and he was extremely quick. I don't know if he actually understood why that was, but that's the way it was for him. So for him, for me to see how quick he was on rear limit limitation circus had real limitation surprised me and that surprised me more than any other teammate his his out, you know his speed on those circuits um, amazing yeah so there's many drivers that had talents and skills that stood out there's not one really that i would just say that he was the best by far Joe, you know when you go through talking of these races you've won the teammates you've had you had a hell of a ride didn't you yeah and i had three world champions as teammates yeah yeah. Uh, Jack as well as Lewis and Fernando. Yeah, but JB, what's next then? You, you're racing in Japan. Um, you are on the box yep. with Sky. What ambitions have you got outside of racing? Is yep. are there any? Well, I'm still racing to be fair, and I don't want to give that up. Still enjoying it. I'm still looking for new challenges. I won the Super GT Champs last year with my teammate Naoki. This year's been a disaster. <laughs> Just one of those things. Um, I did Le Mans, but obviously not with a team that could win Le Mans, but for the experience. Um, I would love to go and race at Le Mans again and fight for the win. I'd love to do other endurance races. Um, Daytona is one. How seriously, though? Would you like to do it with mates or would you like to do it? Oh, no, I want to win. You want to win? Yeah, right. definitely. That hasn't. The only thing I'm doing for fun is off-roading, um, which I'm loving, but still, I want to win. But for me... Out of all the racing I've done, the most difficult has been off-roading, just because it's completely different to anything I'm used to. It's like motocross mixed with off-road powerboat, off offshore powerboating. I have no idea what I'm doing. I'm totally <laughs> lost, and I think I'm quick, and I look at how slow I am. I'm miles off the pace. It's like I don't get it. Where are the quick guys getting getting the speed? I think a lot of the time is in dust. I'm terrible in dust. I'm scared. I think that's the main thing is it quite difficult to read yeah i mean up? if there's no dust i think i'm pretty quick now 
over time, but it's taken me a long time to get up to speed. And some of the problem is the, the bumps are so big, you look at it and think, it's not going to go over that. And it does, but you've got to hit it with confidence and hit it with the front in the air. If you've braked, you're going to roll. So, because you hit the bump wrong. Um, so, there's so much to learn, and that's why I'm enjoying it so much. What, do you want to do I'm the actually Dakar? paying to race. Crikey, haven't it's done the that first time I've yet. ever paid to yeah. race. So, no, <laughs> do you Dakar, want to do the Dakar? Do you no, want to do the... Dakar for me is not what interests me. It's, the, it's, it's Baja. It's, it's racing, and you know. Is it the Baja 1000 down? Yeah, that's what we're doing in November. And it's, for me, that is it's higher speed, there's bigger jumps, there's more action. Navigating through sand dunes isn't what I'm interested in. We also have four navigation systems, whereas in Dakar, you're not allowed that. Dakar, you, it's notes. Um, but for us, we've got a full GPS. You take notes and then it's in the system so your navigator reads them out to you. So very cool. And that's with mates. Um, but racing wise, you know, I want to do things like Le Mans. Um, again, I want to do Daytona, team sports that really interest me. But I also, at some point, I want to race something where it's just me in the car. So I get more time to drive it. I get more time to set it up because I'm one of those drivers that really needs to find a car that works for them. I need to find a balance that works for me and it's different to most drivers. So if I don't have that, I will never be as strong. You know, someone like Lewis is very strong at wringing a car's neck, um, even if the balance doesn't quite suit. For me, if I get the best balance and I get the balance that suits my driving style and it works, I feel that like I'm unbeatable. But uh, if I don't have it, I'm very beatable. <laughs> so uh, it's tricky when you're sharing a car with someone. I mean, it worked last year, we won the championship, but I do miss that a little bit of being able to set up a car up, set up a car how I want it to be. I also miss sitting in a car in the position I want to sit. My teammates like 20 centimeters shorter than me. So it's really, I'm, I'm, I'm like that. I'm, I'm, I'm doing, a, 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 I'm trying to show you, but it's difficult because we're talking on into a microphone. Yeah, but, <laughs> but you're right up against the. Yeah, right up against them. My wrists hurt in a race because my wrists are so twisted. But, on, on but the steering what wheel. can you race? outside of Formula One on your own that is going to give you the same I don't know. satisfaction? I don't know. What, I tell you, you what, would do IndyCar? Would you do IndyCar? No. I've been asked, but I don't, I don't want to do that. That's something I'm not interested in. But um, I don't know. I mean, I'm racing. I'm doing the DTM race. Of course. Not sure when this actually is uh, released. It's actually coming out after the DTM race. Okay. Sorry, congrats. You won Thank the DTM race. <laughs> so that was a great race. Um, <laughs> yeah. So it was basically DTM cars against the Super GT cars. So... Um, three Super GT cars, one Lexus, one Nissan, and our Honda NSX. And my teammate's not doing it. So it's just me. So I'll be doing all the testing. I'll be doing more testing there than I've done all year put together. So I can fit it around me. I've changed the steering wheel position so it's 15 millimeters further away, 10 millimeters high. So it's, it's built for me now. And that's going to be a lot of fun. And then we'll see after that what, what I want to do. But for me, down, high downforce cars are what I need. I need the Lamar style cars I'd love to do hypercar I'd love to help build a car that can go and win them all I think that's a wonderful place to end it gents thank you so much for your time so many memories that come back for me let alone for you just yeah, this, talking it through this it's is only been... a small percentage a lot of the fun stuff I can't talk about yet <laughs> one day <laughs> yeah Jensen thanks for your time really Cheers, good to catch you. up Jensen pulled no punches, did he? What a phenomenal chat. There were so many little gems and explanations in there that will have people saying, ah, okay, I understand now. And it's worth noting that I've never seen Jensen looking more relaxed or happy. He's clearly loving life stateside. And of course, being a dad. Thanks for your time, JB. It was great to catch up. Well, that's it for this episode, but we'll be back next week with yet another big name from the world of F1. Until then, why not subscribe to Beyond the Grid if you haven't already? We're on all of your favorite podcast apps, including Apple and Spotify. And thanks for your feedback about last week's episode with Valtteri Bottas. He's a super cool Finn, isn't he? So likable and fast too. The temperature in my car dropped whilst listening to Valtteri, says Michael Gould. What a super cool, straight-talking guy. If I were to become an F1 driver, I'd certainly want him as my mentor. And I also want to try a bowl of peanut butter porridge. No, you don't, Michael. No, you don't. I tried some peanut butter porridge over the weekend, and it's, shall we say, not as special as Valtteri would have you believe. And I like peanut butter too. 
But thanks for the note, Michael. And please keep your feedback coming. We love it. Remember to use the hashtag F1 Beyond the Grid and you can tweet me at Tom Clarkson F1. Beyond the Grid is produced by F1 in association with Audioboom. Until next time, keep it flat out.